afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest Geotox Express series. Number, I believe it's number nine. I think a few of you have been here for the duration. I was looking at some of the attendee lists, and we have a few folks who have been every session. Commendable. Um, if you're new to Geotox Express, special welcome for joining us for this. What's going to be a very light-hearted presentation. This is non-technical. If you're expecting technical information about our products, I'm sorry, you're likely going to be disappointed. Uh, our objective today is to take what we've described as an alphabetical list, uh, an alphabetical journey uh, through Global Mapper. We're going to uh, basically bring up every letter and try to come up with uh, a, a feature or function pertaining to that letter. We'll do a few demos along the way, talk about some of those functions, uh, maybe do a, a few workflows to, to demonstrate those tools. Uh, I'm joined today by Billy Noble. Hey, Billy, are you with me? Hey, David, how's it going? It's going great. Now, what Billy doesn't realize, and I'm just letting him know this now, is he actually has the hard job today. My job is going to be easy. I'm going to be guiding us through the alphabet, maybe doing a few demos, things like that. Billy's job is to monitor your input. Now, what I would like you to do as we go through the alphabet, um, we have the questions panel. I'll talk about that in just a second, but we have a questions panel on the right side of the screen. Uh, when we come to a letter, I want to see if you can come up with any other suggestions for what we could demonstrate based on that letter. So that is the audience participation process. Again, over on the right side of your screen when you logged into GoToWebinar, you will see that questions panel, and you can use that for suggestions. We are not going to take any technical questions today. That's not the objective of this session, but we'll use that panel for your suggestions, and we're hoping you come up with some creative ones to supplement what we're going to be doing up front. So a few housekeeping issues just before we get rolling. You are in listen-only mode. Obviously, you can hear myself, you can hear Billy, I hope you can, um, but we can't hear you. That's why the questions panel, as I mentioned, is going to allow you to communicate with us. Um, please use that again I'll, I'll, as directed when we begin each letter, if you have a suggestion. Um, uh, the uh, suggestions as to what we might we ha might have for a particular letter. Please make those suggestions. And again, I'll, I'll introduce that as we go through our alphabetical list. Um, this session is being recorded. I always have to check to make sure that that actually is the case, and it is. It's being recorded, so there will be a recording of this um, uploaded uh, to our YouTube channel, to our playlist, actually, our, our Geotox playlist. We have eight videos up there already. This one will be added, and you'll have access to all of those. We'll send you an email within a couple of days once we process it, remove all the ums and ahs that we will inevitably say <laughs> during our session, clean it up a little bit, and we'll upload that, and you'll have access to this uh, uh, on YouTube uh, as a follow-up. Um, our agenda today, let me actually bring back my slides here. Our agenda, well, where, where are we going? Oh, before we get there, my apologies, I always forget this. We have a few more uh, sessions coming up. In fact, we've actually extended the series into November. I don't know if you saw the announcement in our newsletter. Uh, you can go to our website. These have been extremely popular for us, very successful in engaging with our customers. Obviously, in these difficult times, we're all working at home. We're in lockdown situations. These have been a very effective mechanism for us to be able to share what we're doing, share some of the information about our products. So we are going to be continuing these. No end date in sight. We've scheduled them through November. So likely we'll extend them beyond that as well. Upcoming, we're doing these every two weeks. Two weeks from today, we're going to be taking a look at uh, Global Mapper in the context of Mango. Mango is an online mapping uh, uh, service. We have a partnership with the folks who've developed Mango that you can publish your data directly from Global Mapper. So we'll go through some, some scenarios working with Mango Map in a couple of weeks. This is going to be a popular one, I anticipate. We've done this one on occasion in the past, and it's been one of our more popular presentations. We're going to spend an hour looking at the terrain analysis capability of Global Mapper, from generating terrain through all of the analysis functions, some of which, by the way, we'll touch on very briefly today, but obviously when we get into a more specific uh, uh, webinar, we'll go into more detail on, on those tools. Again, that's August 5th. Moving through August, August 19th, Billy and I will be reunited. Are you looking forward to this one, Billy? I am. Yeah, one of the first ones we did was tips and tricks, and we figured we got about halfway through our list. So we decided literally five minutes after we were done, we've got to do this again. We've got to do another one. So we find a slot, August 19th. It'll be tips and tricks, part two, stuff that I guarantee you will not have seen, at least some of you will not have seen in the uh, application. Uh, a little bit for everyone in that one. So again, those are coming up. Information, 
bluemarblegeo.com slash geotuxxp. Uh, you'll see all the registration information for these and the additional sessions uh, coming up. So please register. Um, our agenda for today, what is our goal? What are we going to be covering today? Well, we're going to start with A, then we're going to go to B. After that, we'll go to C. You get the idea. No point in putting the agenda up here. We're going through the alphabet. And by way of starting the alphabet, we're going to start with the letter A. Okay, first audience participation. What do you anticipate we would showcase for A as a function of global number? Getting them coming in already. That's a very specific one. Somebody referenced the altitude of fly-through. If you do a fly-through visualization, yeah. The fly-through is a way to visualize 3D data by simulating a flight. Any others coming in there, Billy? Oh, there's a few more, uh, maybe attribute editing. That's a good one, attribute editing. Auto classification, Auto I see that mm -hmm. one coming in, yeah. No areas? Areas, hmm. yeah. yeah. Area features, maybe? No one has hit the one that I'm doing. We should have had a competition, <laughs> autocorrelation. Uh, we should have had some sort of prize at, you know, for somebody who guessed the right one. Let me go ahead and show you this, and this is what I got. Address geocoding. There's a geocoder in Global Mapper. When I show this to a few people, they're, they're quite surprised that this is in there. There's, you, won't, you probably won't see it as a menu item, but I want to show you where it is. Let me bring up an instance of Global Mapper. And by the way, we don't have a lot of time to do demos. Obviously, we have 26 letters in the alphabet. I'm going to guess just over two minutes per letter, so we're not going to go into a lot of detail, as I mentioned. But from off screen, I'm going to drag in a workspace here. I've got some roads, just as a reference. I've also got a little text file I'm going to pop up in an external window. This is a, a list of people with their addresses and this zip code, as you can see. I'm going to place these on the map. And the process of doing that, the process of assigning this list with the appropriate latitude and longitude is called geocoding. Geocoding is a, tool, is a process that's initiated in Global Mapper from the search menu. Under search, you'll find an option to find address. Now, finding an address could be as simple as typing a specific address. If you want to find you know, your favorite restaurant or your home or whatever, just type the address in here. This uses the same mechanism, the same API, basically, as Google Maps. So if you've searched for an address in Google Maps, you'll have the same results here. Um, what we do with this search is return a latitude and longitude. Now you can place the result on the map or just simply copy that or, or, or capture that and paste it into some sort of report. Um, you can also rather than uh, paste a specific address, geocode from a file. And that's what I'm going to do very quickly here. I'm going to grab the file that I just previewed, my customers, my simulated customers. That is a tab delimited file. We have some column names at the first row, and I'm going to geocode to this loaded road layer. I've got address information here embedded in this road layer, so that will work for me. I could use an online service. Um, you'll note here that it requires Google Maps API. There are certain, uh, there's a limit to the number, but you can grab a new API key by going to this uh, URL if you want. But I'm going to use the loaded data. I'm going to click OK, and there we have our lat long. For each of these locations, we have a latitude and longitude. I could export these to file, or I could place them on the map. Anybody who's used a digitizer will recognize this. I'm just going to call this my customers, and we'll just leave the default settings as far as appearance is concerned, and hopefully you'll see my little dots. We could apply labels if necessary. So that is a geocoding process. That's the process of geocoding for our letter A. A good start. I don't think anybody got geocoding or address geocoding. I guess it could have been a G instead of an A. Let's see where we are next. What comes after A, Billy? Um, I think my I learned it was B, right? You're right. And oh, you know it's my what? name, B. I have to say, <laughs> if people actually had read the abstract, we actually gave the first two away. So those people who responded and didn't get these correct, you didn't actually read the abstract. Um, Bs, we have a few coming in already. What do you think for Bs, Billy? What do you, what do you suggest for Bs? Uh, maybe uh, maybe bounding box, perhaps, or or buffer is. Uh, we have feeling... we have a couple of buffers. I think buffer may be a popular one. We've got a few oh. buffers coming in. Uh, batch convert. Oh, batch convert's a good one. I'll show that tool very quickly. We'll not actually demonstrate it, but that's a good one for B. Any other Bs? I see bearing in there as well. Yeah, if you've got any other suggestions for your Bs, uh, let us know. Blending is another one that comes to mind, where you mm -hmm. can blend images. Oh, bathymetry. Bathymetry, of course. Oh, yeah, dealing with uh, the uh, under undersea world, I guess. Buffering is what I suggested. Buffering, and actually, for a quick demonstration of this, I'm going to use the same data that I had on screen previously. Here's my roads again. 
I want to buffer some of these rows. I'm not going to buffer them all. I'll just zoom into a small section here. I'll use my digitizer. And I'll grab some of my roads. Buffering is derived from selected features. Um, you choose points of lines or polygons or a combination thereof, and you initiate the buffering. This is a digitizer tool. There's a button in the toolbar. If you see where my cursor is, create buffer around selected features. You know, plural is an option. I have multiple roads selected. Um, buffering is an interesting one because it can be, obviously can be specified based on a, a known dimension. And mine's set to 10 meters. Each of these roads will be buffered to an, a 10 meter extent, essentially creating polygons where there are currently lines. But I can create multiple buffers if, if necessary. So I could radiate out from my lines, creating 10, 15, 20, etc. Um, by, by defining not a specific distance, but a uh, an incremental unit, like 5, 10, 15, et cetera. A few other options in here, we're not get to uh, thinking uh, things like deriving the, the buffer distance from an attribute. So if there's a numeric value that's associated with what we're buffering, that can be used to create the buffer. Um, one thing I am going to point out that's important for this particular scenario is the option to combine these overlapping buffer areas. If I left this unchecked, I would get buffers for these roads individually, and they would obviously overlap where they came to the edge of each road. I want to combine them, and so I'm going to use this combine overlapping buffer areas option. Again, we have the option to put it in a name. I'll just call this buffer, and we'll click OK. And hopefully you'll see the results. They're actually selected by default. I want to turn off the original roads layer that I used. I'll deselect. These are my vector polygons. And you can see, if I turn my imagery on to give us a visual context here, you can see I have buffered the roads to create polygons where previously they were center lines. Binning is another one there. Any others come in, Billy, in my absence? Uh, someone talked about uh, block adjustment. Uh, maybe moving features. I'm not particularly sure what that means, but uh, no other guesses for B so far. Yeah, no other guesses for B. Well, we've got a few in there. I think buffering was a popular one. We had a few people um, mm -hmm. mention buffering. Um, we're getting a few comments that people are having sound issues. Uh, this happens occasionally with uh, the go to webinar. Uh, unfortunately, noth nothing we can do about this on our end. My suggestion, obviously, is not very useful if you're not hearing me. But um, if you have sound coming in, going out, maybe logging out, logging back in again, see if the connection, the re the connection works again. Obviously, some people are getting sound, so uh, somebody confirmed that sound is good. So uh, unfortunately, it's a consequence of the platform that we use. Uh, often, it comes down to local settings as well. Maybe your mic or your your um, sound is muted, but hopefully, you can. Um, and those who are not hearing sound will eventually get on board before we get too far through the alphabet. Speaking of. I believe that C is next. Now, this one should be fairly easy. This is a commonly used tool that I've selected, but what do you suggest? What other Cs might we, uh, might we feature here? What other Cs? Yeah, I think, a any suggestions coming in, Billy? Uh, cut polygons cut and poly crop polygons. Cropping, yeah, you get a whole slew of cropping tools, you know, cropping oh, imagery yes. perhaps, or, or yeah, defining mm -hmm. the extent of, of, of vector features and cropping them. <laughs> Our, uh, our Kogo tool is uh, coming up. Oh, popular. excellent. I'm glad somebody <laughs> pointed that one out. Kogo, uh, coordinate geometry. I'll point to that tool. For those of you who are not familiar with Kogo, I'll quickly show that when we open the dialog box. Oh, there's an obvious one I'm seeing coming in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coordinates. Yeah, who didn't put choose coordinates? Shame on you. Coordinates are at the basis of everything we do. Um, oh, combine and crop. Okay. Combine. combine yeah, well. I'll show the crop combine submenu as well when we get into this. This is giving me some direction as to what I should show. <laughs> what I chose is the one that I think a lot of you did choose. Let's go ahead and bring it up, contour generation. I know a lot of you are, have Global Mapper in your toolkit for this reason specifically. We hear from people who say, you know, I, I use Global Mapper for contours. That's what I use it for. So if you have never done that, a very quick demonstration here, very quick workflow. I'm going to unload my roads. I'm not going to save my workspace. And from off screen, I'm going to bring in some nice terrain data here. Um, you may have seen this. We've used this before. This is done in Brazil, uh, coastal Brazil. This is some sand dunes. I'm going to generate some contours of these sand dunes. Just before I do, some of the other things you pointed out, some people pointed out Kogo. That's a digitizing function right here. I'm not going to open it. This allows me to digitize or draw based on entering the dimensions of a feature rather than manually drawing. So it's very useful if you know the, the dimensions, for instance, of a property. You can enter those manually. Um, some others, crop combine. I'm just going to show you that. I don't have, I'll, I'll do that after the fact, actually, when I have my, con my contours generated, I'll show you that option. Contours, how do we generate contours? Right here at the top in my analysis toolbar, create contours. Fairly intuitive how this works. Um, 
we define a contour interval. Uh, I want to make these one meter contours just for this example. The rest of the settings pertain to things like uh, the index contours, ma major and minor, um, the resolution at which the data will be analyzed to generate our contours. We're going to put our labels on there. Obviously, we want meters or feet. In my case, are going to be meters. We want to smooth them. This is a fairly new function where we look for local peaks and depression, depressions based on the presence of concentric contours. So if we have at least two concentric contours, we'll define that as a local peak, a peak, a peak and you'll see a little icon denoting that also with depressions. Um, I also dis discard the contours that are smaller than 25 meters. You can vary these settings obviously based on your situation. Final thing I'm going to do is just constrain the contours to my current screen view. So under contour bounds, we will limit it just to the data that's on my screen. If I were doing this properly, I would type the proper name, one meter contours, but in the interest of time, I'll continue. And we will see when this completes. We have some really nice contours, as you can see. The little icons, as I noted, indicate where there are local peaks, uh, areas where there are at least two concentric contours defining a peak or two concentric, uh, two or more concentric contours defining a depression. Here in our, our dunes, we can see a little depression in here. Again, depression over here and a peak over here. So you can see these annotations indicating where uh, the local uh, high points and low points are. Um, one of the uh, other suggestions for C was crop combine, etc. I'll show you that in just a second. I want to select one of these lines. These are vector lines, so they're completely editable. And if I right click after selecting a vector feature, there's an entire area where we can crop combine split. Now this will depend on what you've selected. If I had selected a shape point or a vertex, I would have the option to split the line based on that vertex. If I'd selected a line and a polygon, I could use the line to split the polygon. So it really depends on what has been selected, what will be available here. But somebody pointed that out, the crop combined split, etc. And that's what we're seeing right here. So were there any other Cs out. that I missed there, Billy? Oh, there was one, uh, there was a funny one here, but uh, creatively crafting COVID cartography. Um, <laughs> that's kind of funny. We do actually do have online sources for uh, COVID data, but maybe David could show you once we get to a particular yeah, letter. It's, it's not, it's not required that you make all of your responses, but again, with the letter C, just, just the, the broad theme. Yeah, we do have COVID data uh, available in our online data. You'll notice right here, I click the globe button, by the way. Um, COVID data. In fact, well, um, I'm going to give you a little prezec because that online data is one of my bullets a little bit later. But COVID data, we have some of the, uh, the Johns Hopkins data we all have seen in the news organizations, a few others. We're a main company, so we've got some local data as well, U.S. data by county. These are all streamable, obviously, in the real-time data as well. So if you are interested in monitoring the situation, these are in here. You can also add additional da data sources if you're aware of them, not just obviously for COVID, but for any online sources that you, you might want. So we're cheating a little bit here, getting ahead of ourselves, but uh, C is for contours. Let's move along. D. We're not making much progress here. It's already 20 minutes after the arm. We're just up to D. I think we're going to have to a little fast, go a little faster. Uh, D. Any suggestions for D? So far, someone said smoothing a dem. Smoothing a dem. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we could we could adjust the resolution of a dam. Oh, oh, a bunch of came, just came in. Digitize, uh, delete. Yeah, delete would be one effective feature. Delete and on delete, you can on delete. Control Z or Control Z will work to on delete. We've got another dam come in there yet. Mm -hmm. Any that you can think of, Billy? You can help me here. Any that? Oh, oh, oh uh, dynamic hill shading. Oh, I'll use that button yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I could actually show that. While we're waiting for the other Ds to come in, dynamic hill shading, this little tool right here, if you haven't seen it before, kind of tucked in the toolbar, allows us to adjust the angle of the sun to reflect kind of the texture on the terrain. You'll notice my, my visualization is changing. This reflects where the sun would be implied in the in the sky. You can move this around quite literally. It changes the altitude and azimuth to reflect the shadow. So quick demonstration of that one. My D, and I think a couple of people may have mentioned this, digitizing. Mm 
it's at the foundation for a lot of what we do in Global Mapper. You may not do a lot of work with vector data, even if you work with raster data, chances are you have to draw something at some stage, even if it's a, an area to use for cropping your raster data or tiling, you may generate some tiles. So the digitizer, we could probably spend the rest of the hour and then the next two or three sessions talking about the details of the digitizer. I won't, obviously. Let's take a quick look at the digitizer and one specific tool I want to show you. I'm going to unload this. Control U to unload. If you're working with Global Mapper, you want a simple way to clean your map. And from off screen, you want to drag and drop another little workspace. This has just got some imagery. The digitizer is this array of buttons you're seeing here, continuing right through some of our editing functions. All of these buttons pertain to working with vector data, creating, editing, changing, modifying, whatever you need to do. The overlying function is actually a tool that's activated using this tool. This allows me to edit vector features. What I'm going to do is draw some vector features. In fact, I'm going to draw the outline of this unsuspecting building right here. I'm going to use a rectangle or a, an area tool for that. But because I can see these are nice right angle corners, I'm not going to freehand this. Instead, I'm going to activate what we refer to as right angle draw mode. This will allow me to draw the first line freehand. Every line thereafter will be a right angle. It will ensure that my drawing will be precise outlines, right angle bit corners where I'm drawing this building. Now, I'm not a, the greatest drawer, but I'll try my best here. I'm going to draw the first uh, side of the building. And again, as I said, every line hereafter is constrained to 90 degrees. You can see my cursor will only go in 90 degree directions. We'll go up to the front of the garage. Little of these people know we're drawing their house. And we can finish this right up here. And obviously we will apply this, but that's just one example of digitizing or drawing using the digitizer. It's, it's a very expansive component of Global Mapper. I'm not actually even going to save this. So D is for digitizer. Let's move on. What else have we got? We've got the letter E coming up. This is going to be an interesting one. See who can guess what E might be. Oh, that's a good one coming in already. Elevation exaggeration. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm, I removed my elevation allies. I could, I could have demonstrated that. That's a you know the terrain, which is relatively flat. You can accentuate it to make it look a little, I don't know, exaggerated, I guess would be the word. Yeah, that's something you can use in the 3D viewer using the... Uh, exaggerate function. Yeah, or in the profile view as well, you can you know, yep. exaggerate your profile by defining, you know, basically expanding the window, but exaggerates the terrain. Editing. Mm -hmm. yeah, editing would be a simple one. Somebody said export there. That's a very basic one as well. I and mean, most workflows are, are eventually, I would assume, have, going to have some level of export, getting your data out of the application. That was a good one. But no one has mentioned the one that I have. This I should mention. The feature I'm about to show you is specific to the LiDAR module, which is the add-on, if you're not familiar with Global Mapper, the base product, um, has an add-on that lets you process LiDAR data, work with LiDAR data. And what I su suggested for the E is extraction. It's a very, very mm -hmm. powerful tool that lets you extract vector features from a point cloud. Now, I'm going to show you one example of this. Um, this, again, is a pretty involved workflow, so I'm not going to go through the details. I've actually got one I've prepared already, but I'll show you the context in which it was used. In fact, some of you may have seen this before. If you're regular viewers of our presentations, you've probably seen this data. This is a LiDAR point cloud. These are LiDAR points which have been classified to differentiate buildings from ground, from vegetation, and there's a few gray points here which are completely unclassified. We don't know what they are. I'm going to look specifically at these vegetation points for the purpose of extracting individual trees. Uh, I'm not going to, to go into the, the details of how I do it, but the, the uh, component, which again is enabled through the LiDAR module, is right here, extracting vector features. I'll just pop up the dialog box quickly. We can extract buildings from, obviously, like orange points, trees, which we will do in a second, power lines and power poles are the four options that we can use to automatically create vector features. When we talk about extracting, we're talking about creating vectors. I've already done this with my trees. I'm going to turn that layer on. I'll turn the original points off. And we now have the location of each tree uh, that was derived from my point cloud. For each tree, we have, I'll just choose one randomly. We have the elevation, which is a height above sea level. We have its height which is a subtraction of the local ground from my elevation. It's a 24 meter tall tree. And then spread information, how wide is it? So this information is now available for all of these trees. If I pop this up into 3D, bring my 3D view up, 
a little bit of oh I got my sea level my water turned on bear with me for a second while I turn that off I don't need to show my water display in this case we'll turn that off and you can see now the results of that this is actually a 3d model uh, that was applied to each tree and scaled according to the height so from a point cloud I can a identify where the trees are and then b extract the individual trees and have them display on an appropriate scale. So this again was derived from LiDAR. This is an example of how we can extract data from a point cloud, from LiDAR, from any other type of point cloud. Any other E's, Billy? All right, I'm not seeing any E's coming in. Um... I guess Elevation is a common one. But. Elevation, of course. Yeah. These ones I didn't remember. I was thinking, what can I do for E? I, wouldn't even, I didn't even think of elevation. That would have been one I should have thought of as well. Let's move on. F. What have we got for F? This is a more specific one. I'd be surprised if anyone finds this one because it's, it's not a primary function of Global Mapper, but it's something that's worth noting. There's actually various options pertaining to this broad uh, uh, oh. function. Force exit. Uh, <laughs> Force exit. Yeah. <laughs> Control Alt Delete. Find. Hmm. So that's kind of like a search a query. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I see somebody did fly through again. That would have been a good one. Yep. Yeah. I, I wish I'd done fly through. That would have been a better one to demonstrate in this example. Yeah. Find. Yeah. You know, we could obviously have done a, a query. Um, Just one I thought of was uh, fit point clouds. Yeah, absolutely. That's been a good one where we can, uh, if you've got two overlapping point clouds, you can uh, basically match one to the other so they align themselves. Obviously, different flight lines, maybe different generations of LiDAR. Gosh, we're getting a lot of Fs coming in. I didn't realize there was that many Fs. What I have, flood analysis. Now, this might be a kind of a, a, an interesting one. You know, Where's the flood analysis tool? There's actually multiple tools in Global Mapper for dealing with flood or flood analysis. Now, I'm going to show you one. Um, very quickly here, that's actually embedded in the application as an extension. From the help menu, if I go to the license manager, and you can all do this, you will see an extension in here called the Coast extension. This is a little add-on tool that we developed in, in conjunction with a local university here in Maine for analyzing the impact of coastal flooding, not from simply a geographic perspective, you know, how much intrusion is there, but also from a financial perspective by bringing in property values. So if you're living in a coastal situation and you want to maybe analyze this, there's some corresponding documentation uh, available in the help files. And actually, I think we have some sample data to play with as well. This is free. You can enable this and this will allow you to do some analysis of flooding. A couple of other things we have here, I'll close this dialog box. Um, from the analysis menu, kind of hidden in here, so not a lot of people pay attention to it, is the option to simulate water level rise and flooding. Once again, based on the terrain and based on the parameters you enter, I'm not going to demonstrate it right now, but you can enter information uh, about uh, the flood characteristics, the rise on water level, etc. And that's another way. You may have noted in my 3D view that I had uh, a, a 3D um, visualization of water intrusion. There's options for doing that both in 2D and 3D. I want to turn my trees off. I'll turn my imagery off as well. And we're going to be left with an underlying surface model. Noting my al altitude here, my, al my, my height, I want to enable the display of water in this area. Just a visualization. This from um, the configuration dialog box. It's actually a shader option. Or, sorry, it's not. It's a vertical option where we choose water display. And we can define exactly what that is. Now, again, but based on my my uh, uh, horizontal vertical scale, I'm just going to type in 15 here, and we'll apply, and hopefully we'll see where water would intrude to with that height. A little bit of a, a dip in the water here, maybe bump it up to 20 meters. A little bit of more of a catastrophic flood event. And this is simply a visualization tool, noting what water is intruding into the terrain based on that level. And obviously with our coastal areas being under threat with the rising sea levels, etc., this is a useful tool, not just for you know sea level rise, but for those coastal storm type events, giving us an idea where we need to take action. It's an option you can turn on. I just turned it off. You can obviously do it in the 3D view as well. You may have noticed that before as well. So flood analysis, various flavors of that was my F. G comes next. Oh, somebody sent feathering for F. I wish I'd seen that one. Feathering. Feathering both elevation and feathering imagery. That would have been a good one to demonstrate. We have got two different images. They don't match visually. You can feather them together to make that transition a lot smoother. But we're up to G. Making progress here. 
first guess is GeoPDF, remove caller, <laughs> very specific uh, option in the options tab of a raster. I'm going to assume somebody has done that already. <laughs> that's why they, yeah. that's probably the reason they have Global Mapper for removing the caller from a GeoPDF. GeoPDF in general is one that's worth noting. Um, I've, I'll see if I have some data. GeoPDF, uh, basically a PDF file that has multiple internal components. And Global Mapper allows you to load that as either a raster or a vector. And not only removing, mm -hmm. removing the caller, but also um, selecting which specific, fun which specific layers are displayed. So you can filter the input. You know what, I'm gonna actually show that. I have some data if you'll bear with me for a second. This was not my bullet. I will get to mine in just a second. But from off screen, I'm going to find, it shouldn't take too long. I'm gonna find an example of a Geo PDF and I found one already. I'm gonna unload the data I have on my screen right now. And from off screen, I'll drag this Geo PDF. This is a topographic map. This is what I was talking about where we can decide on the map elements to display from this geo PDF, all of these different uh, internal uh, components within the PDF, and the fact that we can import them as a raster or as a vector. We basically get vector versions of all of these features. I'm not gonna go any further with this, but if you have a geo PDF, you will have this option, not only to, as was mentioned, to remove the color, but to remove all the other elements as well. Um, the, the person who noted that may also be referring to the fact that there's a crop option that also will automatically remove the color, so. Anything else, Billy? Anything else coming in? Oh, I see some good guesses here. Uh, we have ground classification, um, GPS, uh, geocalc mode. Uh, some good G's in here. Yeah, Geo I mean, geocalc mode is a good one. Uh, those who are interested in more advanced coordinate management, um, coordinate conversion, datum transformation, may want to take a look at geocalc mode. It's not something that you have available out of the box. It does require you to have a copy of our other application, Geographic Calculator. And if you do, um, you can enable a more advanced projection management. That's as much as I'll mention. It is actually a toolbar, not enabled in my case, but you can go to the view menu and you will actually see GeoCalc listed here. Again, this does require a licensed version of Geographic Calculator, but this is a way that Blue Marble's two major applications can, uh, can communicate with each other. We had a, at least one mentioned GPS, am I right, Billy? Yes, we did. That is mine. That was what I was proposing for this. It is worth noting, not something we spend a lot of time on. Obviously, obviously you know, from a presentation point of view, to really see GPS at work, you need to get out into the field and need to be you know, in your vehicle or, or driving or moving around. But there is a GPS component of Global Mapper. And with a lot of folks today using um, more lightweight like laptop tablet type devices as opposed to you know a hard you know desktop machine or a laptop machine certainly this is now a viable option with a, a connected GPS receiver um, a Bluetooth GPS receiver you can turn Global Mapper into a tracking device there's no navigational tool we often get that question can you type in an address and get turn by turn directions no that's not what this is intended for um, it is it's going to give you the, the tracking information I'll show you in the context of the application actually from the GPS menu, if you have that device connected, start tracking, it will record a track log. Um, there are other options to record waypoints and things like that. You can also look at the information about your GPS receiver, all of the, the data stream information as well. So kind of hidden in, in the toolbar, we don't pay much attention to it internally. Billy, you, you take a lot of our tech support questions. Do you have a lot of questions come in about GPS? Yeah, we have some uh, occasionally, um, just kind of how you uh, integrate, uh, like, the, data you collect in the field and also just hooking up a GPS device to a Global Mapper. Yeah, and, and obviously if GPS or, or mobile applications are of interest, um, we have a mobile app that you know most mobile devices now are GPS enabled uh, and you can send any data to your mobile device. So Global Mapper in that context becomes you know part of your GPS receiver. So GPS was my G, congratulations if that was your guess. H. I'm having to look at my own notes to see what I said myself. What H? Oh, this is a good one. I like this one. This is a fun tool. Uh, hill shading. Uh, we covered it, that one in the D, actually, the dynamic hill shading. But Hill shading would have been a good guess. Mm -hmm. Height above ground. <laughs> looking at LiDAR data. Yeah, height above ground. While, while the answers are coming in, please keep those coming. These suggestions are great, by the way. I'm going to do v version two of this presentation now that I have all these suggestions that I didn't think of. <laughs> height above ground is a visualization option for LiDAR data. LiDAR will, be, by default, display 
a Z value, a Z value, which is absolute height. And you can represent that visually based on a shader. Uh, there is an option to change the appearance of your LiDAR data based on a number of different variables depending on what it is you want to do. That might be visualizing by classification or visualizing by um, intensity of return, things like that. One of those options that was added relatively recently is the option to visualize by height above ground, which is very useful. Obviously, if you're not concerned about the actual absolute height, but how high the structures are, or the trees or the buildings, based on the surround, surrounding ground. It's actually remarkable how that works. Um, it, it, you know, Let's say your point cloud is 50 million points. It will literally calculate for every point what the offset is between the local ground, where it, determ it basically determines what that local ground height would be, and then subtracts, gives you a value, and it happens in seconds. It, that, that calculation happens in seconds, and as a result, then we obviously visualize. So thank you for the person who mentioned height above ground. Any others, Billy? Um. That's a good one is help files. Um, oh, can, you can find it. that within the app, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, um, HSV would be one of the shader options. I'm looking at a few of the answers coming in myself. So, um, yeah. So, if, if you, few technical questions come in again. Uh, this is, you know, this is a different type of presentation. We're not going to take a lot of your technical questions. We'll, I'll give you an email address at the end, and we can have you contact tech support with any of those more technical questions. My suggestion for H, which I believe one person did did so did uh, choose heat map, heat map or density map. You may hear it refers to it as density map, and think, in fact, I think the bullet in the toolbar is referred to as a density map. This is a very interesting one. Um, I'm going to drag again from off screen. I'm going to drag in a workspace here with some data, and these are points. I've got some points. You may recognize geographically. This is the state of Massachusetts, just a little bit to our south, city of Boston, right in here. Um, these points represent vernal pools. Now, those not familiar with the kind of the natural environment of this part of the world, we do get a lot of snow in this area. Uh, after the snow melts, a lot of that meltwater accumulates and creates what are temporary pools. They're very significant um, for the local ecosystem. They obviously don't support permanent species because they do dry up when the summer comes along. But these vernal pools have been mapped, and this is what we have, a map of the 29,000 vernal pools in the state of Massachusetts. What I wanted to visualize here is a heat map or a density map uh, indicating where the highest concentrations are. That function is available in the toolbar. Create density map or heat map as noted here. I'm not going to worry about the settings. I'm just going to click OK. Turn off my points so we can see a little clearly. And now we can see a density map indicating where the high concentration is. And this can be used for any type of data, any type of point data, not only based on proximity or closeness or you know, density, but also based on any of the inherent attributes. So the points may have had a numeric variable. We could have derived our visualization based on whatever that value was. Rainfall, for instance, if these were weather stations. So density mapping. This visualization, by the way, is exactly the same visualization that will be used for a terrain there. We basically borrowed that visualization from mapping terrain. How are we doing for time, Billy? Do I need to speed up a little bit? We have about 20 minutes left. Oh my goodness, we do have to speed up a little bit. Probably a <laughs> minute, per, less than a minute per letter. And there's some fun ones to come. Let's keep going then. Uh, what's after H? I, oh, I cheated. I hit my button twice there. Oh okay. no. Some said import or info tool, feature info. That would have been a good one. Feature info, click on a vector feature to get all the attributes. Importing, obviously, a very important one as well. Anything else, Billy? Um, someone mentioned image swipe. Oh, that's a good um, one as well. In fact, I'm going to show this workflow very quickly, and I'll show you image swipe. Let me go ahead and do this one. Again, we'll make this as quick as we can. Image rectification, without getting into too much technical detail, is a tool that you can bring in an image, a, a, a picture, basically, that has no geographic information, and position it or align it correctly. Now, the image that I'm going to work with is an historic map. Um, I'm going to... Simply load up that file. Oops, I'm in the wrong location here. Let me go up to my desktop. Uh, a little bit of a navigation through my folders here. And it's an 1875 map. It's just a picture. There's no geographic information. Um, I'm being prompted what I want to do with it. I'm going to rectify it. And without going into the details of what this does, it basically allows me to um, define its location based on assignment of control points. I've got them already added here. I did it um, as a preparation. I click OK to initiate this. It's probably the fastest I've ever done a demonstration of image uh, rectification. But I get a version of that 
picture that is now geographically aligned. I'll zoom in a little closer here and we'll be able to address another one of the eyes, which is image swipe. A little bit of a low resolution image here, as you can see. Uh, if I want to see what's underneath, I could turn the image off or I could use the image swipe tool. This is the tool I'm, I'm pointing to right now. This allows me to pull back an image to see what's underneath. And I can see how well it aligns. A little bit close here. Maybe I'll back up a little bit so it's, we're not seeing those pixels. But again, using the image swipe tool, we can pull back and see the underlying data that we used for reference. So that image rectification, but also a bonus image swipe. Ah, I did it again. I hit my my mouse twice. My finger, my trigger <laughs> fingers to joining attributes is J. Ah, who would have guessed joining? Somebody actually mentioned that joining attributes. A couple of people did. That's the only J I could think of as well. Do you think of any other J's, Billy? Uh, that was the only one I could think of too. <laughs> it's an obvious one. I'm not going to do a demonstration on this one, but basically this is a tool that lets you uh, take an attribute uh, or, or a, a attribute file from an external table and using a common value, join them to a, a layer that already exists on the map. Um, we've done this before in other presentations and there's a lot of documentation obviously if you want to, if you're interested in this. Um, we've redesigned the dialog box. You're seeing that a little bit over here on the uh, on the, the side of the map, but uh, yeah, joining attributes would be that process. Okay, let's move on. This is an interesting one. Okay, I managed just to click my button once this time. Uh, someone mentioned KMZ files, okay. import and export. <laughs> Any other cares? I've got one that's actually it just I literally have just thought of it, but I I didn't I didn't uh, put it in my notes. Somebody mentioned. What did it happen to be keyboard shortcuts? It is Billy. Gosh, you're reading my mind. Oh, keyboard wow. shortcuts. <laughs> uh, there are obviously a lot of pre-formatted keyboard shortcuts, but you can also add your own. Uh, I'll show you when I bring up the interface where the keyboard shortcuts are. I think a couple of people did actually bring this one up. KML, KMZ support, keyhole markup language. This is Google's language. I'm actually going to show a very specific application of this. Obviously, we can import and we can export KMZ files. I'm not going to save this previous workspace. Um, I'm going to bring in a layer just with some parcel data, some property information here, as you can see. I'm going to close the attribute table. I don't need that. Um, this is just a vector file. Um, I'm going to select all of the features in this vector file with my digitizer. They're all highlighted, all selected, just you know, waiting for me to edit them or whatever I need to do. But what I want to do instead is from the view menu, this is kind of hidden in here. I'm going to go to zoom view all the way up to the bottom, zoom to view in Google Earth. This is a tool that allows me to transpose the extent of my current map view in Global Mapper into Google Earth. And if I have selected vector features, which is something I have done now, it will ask me if I want to include those in the Google Earth view, which I'll say yes to. Now what happens? Well, this is loading here. My Google Earth instance is loading and hopefully it'll take me to where my data is. I've generated a KML file. You can see it right over here, Google, a uh, Global Mapper view KML. And I can see my data immediately in Google Earth. If you want a, a visual context for your data, View, zoom to view in Google Earth. I get all my vectors, including the shading, including whatever attributes. I don't have any attributes for these uh, features, obviously, but this is now a Google Earth view of what you were looking at in Google Mapper. What I like this for specifically is Street View. I'm looking at my data, I'm looking at my properties. I can jump into Street View. We all know and love Street View, and I can see the actual houses that I'm mapping, the actual properties that I'm mapping by using Street View in conjunction with the visual display of your vectors. Oops. I'm flying a little fast, of your vectors from um, Global Mapper. So integration with, with Google Earth, somebody mentioned that as a G, I believe, but certainly KML support. We could manually export and import, but we can also do it in an automated way as well. I'm going to discard my KML. Okay, I think we're going to overshoot a little bit by the top of the hour, but that's fine. We're, we're having fun. K, worse after K, L. This should be an obvious one for this one. I think a few people have got it done already. Any any coming from you, Billy? Do you see any coming into the questions panel? Uh, linking 2D, uh, the legends and labeling. Oh, yeah, well, very good. I, we definitely have to do another version of the labeling, obviously. Legend, yeah. if you've got a, a, a vector map. Um, it's a very popular one, I see. 
I do too. It's an, it's an acronym for a data. I think it's called LIDAR. Used to be an acronym. <laughs> I think it's a word. Now. I'm not even going to go any further with this. I actually had a workflow set up to, shoot, to create a terrain model from LIDAR. Uh, we're not going to do that. In the interest of time, we've all seen LIDAR. We've all used LIDAR. Got a little screenshot of a point cloud here. Obviously, Global Mapper supports LIDAR, both with and without the LIDAR module. The LIDAR module is certainly recommended if you're working with LIDAR data because it gives you tools for extraction, uh, reclassification, and like Billy mentioned, uh, fit LIDAR, uh, LIDAR Q C tools, um, et cetera, et cetera, ground identification, the list goes on. Um, so LIDAR has been part of Google Mapper's makeup for many, many, many years, and the LIDAR module is proof of that. So if you're using LIDAR data or interested, uh, go ahead and grab the LIDAR module, or you can add it onto your instance of, uh, of Google Mapper. That was an easy one, saved us a little time without having to demonstrate that. M, what have we got for M? A measure tool, someone uh, map layout, Oh, good one, yeah. I thought of one, uh, Mango Map. Oh, <laughs> someone good, also. Good oh. segue to, to next, <laughs> the next presentation. Thank you for that one. Yeah, good. Somebody obviously was listening to my introduction. <laughs> maps, good one. Yeah, Maps would be a great one. Um, that, that's part of Global Mapper. Um, what I have, mobile app. I have to do a lot oh. here for Global Mapper Mobile. I did mention it before. Um, this is a free app. You can grab it from the iStore uh, or Play, was it? App Store, I guess, or Play Store, Android or iOS versions. Um, mm -hmm. There is a premium version as well, a pro version, we call it, which has got some really, really nice tools for doing more advanced field mapping. Uh, great for field data collection, great for data visualization. It ties in directly with your desktop version of Global Mapper. So all those data sets that you work with locally in the desktop, you can put them on your phone, you can go into the field, you can go to the job site. So a little plug for Global Mapper Mobile, uh, download it. Today, it's right on the App Store. We just came out with a new version. Um, in fact, one of our previous presentations, uh, Jeff and myself went through a workflow showing how that works. So when you get the link to this presentation, you can also see the uh, presentation on Global Mapper Mobile. So mobile app was my M. N. I couldn't think of too many for this one. Um, see, uh, no guesses yet so far in the questions. <laughs> we stumped them with N, wow. I wonder if anybody thinking about X. I wonder who's got X on their mind. What what could X possibly be? No suggestions coming in at all. Wow. I think we stumped next, them. Next version? <laughs> next version. Next version is coming now, up in September. Now come in the fall. <laughs> come, uh, end of September. Look out, end of September is the tentative plan for ver version 22 of Global Mapper. Negative elevation is a good one. Beth, is that you know, bathymetry as well would possibly be part of that. Um, I think someone has mine at NDVI analysis. A normalized difference vegetation index, which is a raster calculation tool. Um, I do have a workspace for this, and I, again, we are going to run out of time. We're only at the ends, but I want to show you this very quickly. I'm going to unload my data. And I'm going to show you the results of that. I'm also going to show you the dialog box very quickly here. I have some Landsat imagery. I've got two bands. I've got near infrared, and I've got red. Uh, obviously, we're not getting into any more technical detail, but we can perform uh, an analysis, a calculation from the analysis menu, raster calculation. Um, the results of that are going to be an index value where we determine the relative greenness. And to show you the results, I have index for June. I've also got one for September here as well, and we could do a comparison. So that's NDVI. If you're not familiar with this, there is some documentation, obviously, internally within the application. Someone mentioned help as an H. We have help, obviously, available. You can read more detail. Um, but this, again, is an example of our raster calculator, NDVI. Congratulations to those of you who came up with that. And it's surprising how few Ns there are. I would have thought there'd be more. There was one more, network license. Network <laughs> license would have been a good one. Uh, if your company is using multiple instances, you'll definitely want to be considering a network license. Um, allows you to borrow, individuals to borrow licenses when they need it to. Everyone doesn't have to be ass assigned an individual license. So licensing options, you can find more information on our website on what's most appropriate for you or your company. I'll give you a clue on this one. I've actually said this one and referenced this one before. We're already getting some suggestions coming in from my O. Overlapping features is a is an interesting guess. Overlapping, uh, there's an interesting little tool in the in the in the analysis menu for counting the number of overlapping raster layers. 
very specific, and it will give you a color code to denote how many overlapping raster layers. It's actually designed for um, shared analysis. You have to teach me that one. I <laughs> never yeah, played around yeah. with that. <laughs> I have to to my training class, Billy. Any other O's? Anything you can think of, Billy, for O's? Uh, my overview map. Uh... I'm actually rectification. Gonna, I'm going to cover two here. I've just realized I want to cover two O's in, in one fell swoop. For me, online data access. Some of you may, may have noted I, I mentioned earlier uh, we previewed the online data access, but I've, I figured this merited its own letter. The ability to take uh, to stream data from multiple sources, imagery, topographic maps, terrain data, etc. And I did show you that dialog box before. Let me, in the context of where we were, which is I believe in Colorado, bring in some online data. Um, the online data access, as I, I mentioned before, right here, this little button, top left corner, looks like a globe. Um, you'll see categorized lists. We mentioned the COVID data before, but obviously there's other types of data in here, terrain data, topographic maps. We have a section of worldwide data for those outside the US. These are global, the global di digital elevation model, for instance. I really like this one. I saw this one uh, before, the general bathymetric chart, uh, really sharp bathymetric data, that would have been appropriate for whoever selected bathymetry under the Bs. I'm going to bring in OpenStreetMap. This is a rasterized version of the OpenStreetMap, which is vector natively, but it gives you a really nice backdrop for whatever map projects you want. And it is scalable. As I zoom in, Loveland, Colorado here, it will resample. We're obviously seeing my NDVI, but you'll see the tiles coming in. This is now streaming data. Uh, OpenStreetMap is just one example another O of one of the online sources that we have access to. So if you're not using any of the online sources, please take a look at what we have here. Most of them are free. There's a few premium sources as well that you would require a subscription for. That was my O. P, important one. Oh boy, the P's are coming in from thick and fast here. Oh, <laughs> I see uh, pixels to points. Oh, that would have been obvious. Why didn't I? My goodness, perfect. Pixels to points are, are the tool, for those of you not familiar, as part of our LiDAR module, for generating 3D data from overlapping images, specifically drone images, or more commonly drone images. This is a photogrammetric analysis tool. If you're using a drone, you'll want to take a look at that for, again, 3D reconstruction. What else have we got, Billy? I'm relying on you to help me here. We also have a path profile. Uh, Perfect. We also have polygons. Something you can digitize with yeah. a digitizer tool. Yep, yep, okay. I, I, well, mine, I think one person, I'm looking at one person got mine. Actually, no, I don't even see it. I'm surprised nobody got this one. Projection management. It's key to what we do. Obviously, projection or the management of projection management, management of coordinate reference systems is key. Everything we put in Global Mapper is assigned to a known projection. Um, Again, I'm not going to spend the time to demonstrate it at length, but if you need to reproject your map, currently we're WGS84, UTM Zone 13 North, as noted at the bottom of my screen, if I need to reproject. Shortcut is to double click where it says current workspace in your control center. It will allow you to redefine the projection parameters, essentially reproject. This is how the reprojection is applied for export as well. Whatever projection is present on your screen is inherited by whatever layers are exported. So. Projection management is key for a lot of what we do in Global Mapper, obviously. I bet you nobody gets this one. I think one person did. <laughs> oh, maybe. Someone's at querying? Query would be an obvious one, yes, but that's not mine. I have something even a little more interesting here coming up. Any 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 advances on query, Billy? Any other suggestions? Q and A. Q and A. <laughs> Q &A yeah. Get that on our website for a lot of our, our products. Yeah, nothing else coming in. Else. Nothing else. So, who has heard of a quiver plot, or who was aware that a quiver plot is an option? A quiver plot is basically a visualization of point data based on direction and magnitude. And what you're seeing on the little screen here is currents. I'm actually going to show you that workflow. It's very very interesting. I'm going to unload this data. And from off screen, once again, I'm going to drag in a new workspace. This happens to be off the coast of uh, northwestern India. 
um, we have some points. These points represent sampled locations for ocean currents. They're just points, they're just dots. But if I use my info tool, I select one. I have a U component and a V component. And again, without getting into too, too many of the technical details, the U component and V component imply magnitude along the X and along the Y axis or relative to the X and the Y axis. And it's the calculation of these two variables in the direction that allows Global Mapper to determine the aggregate magnitude and the aggregate direction of the flow of these currents. So to visualize that, it's another visualization option for a layer, I'm going to double click, go to the options for that layer, under point styles, all the way at the bottom, there's my cue. Use quiver plot to define the visualization. Um, you can use this again based if you have a U and V component associated with your data, or it could simply be a direction and magnitude. Direction being compass direction, magnitude being whatever it is, wind speed or whatever, you'll get the same end result. Um, I'm going to make sure that this is appropriately assigned, U, U component, V component, everything else should be fine. It's assigning this an arrow, just a generic arrow, that is scalable. And you'll see this in just a second when we finish. We click OK. The size of the arrow denotes the strength of the current in that direction. Now, obviously, in the direction of the arrow indicates the direction of the current. So you can see an interesting little eddies in the current here. This is a quiver plot. This is an example of a quiver plot, a visualization of point data, again, based on magnitude and direction. I've done this with slopes as well, by the way, because the direction of a slope and the angle of a slope would be the two variables, and you can actually visualize slopes using a, the same basic process with point data. I think we're getting close to the end of the alphabet. Ah, I did it again. Three times I... Okay, what other than rast or feathering might one have suggested for the R's? I should have put uh, up a way on my slide, Joe. Uh, rotate. Rotate, I mean, rotate map or rotate a feature. While these are coming in, let me show that very quickly here. That's an interesting one that we don't often demonstrate, but this map is by, by default going to be north up, as, of the, as are all the maps. Right here is an option to rotate the map. Um, this allows you to basically define a bearing clockwise from the horizontal, and you can align the map whatever way you want. You're not changing the geographic context. It's almost like taking your monitor and putting it on its side. So rotation is an option. Rectum. We have one for raster calculation. Yeah, that's uh, NDVI. That was an example yeah. of NDVI again, uh, an example of raster calculation. Raster feathering obviously is something I have on here. Uh, I mentioned, I believe, earlier that this is a tool where if you've got overlapping raster layers, you can feather them together. Um, if they overlap each other, you're seeing on the right side of this screen uh, the unfeathered area and a fairly distinct abrupt transition from a low resolution image to a high resolution image. Just visually, it looks awkward. Over here, we've created this feathered approach, so it's still not perfect. We're still dealing with low res and high res, but at least this transitional boundary is a little cleaner, and this could be exported as a single image now if you needed to apply this to you know, a file and use it in another application. Um, feathering can also be applied to elevation, by the way, uh, in which case it will not just uh, feather visually, but also feather the actual elevation value, so it creates a more transitional slope, if you like. Okay. I promise I'll only click once this time. S. Select tool. Hmm. Yeah, we've used that already, the digitizer, selecting. Yeah, that would be a good one. Hard to do Spatial anything. Spatial databases. Yep, worth noting. One. Uh, as well as being able to load data from a file, you can yep. load from a spatial database. Absolutely, you can connect to your ArcSDE instance and read and write from those spatial databases. Someone mentioned snapping, any snapping uh, features? Yeah, snapping basically the ability when you're drawing to uh, connect, if you like, to an existing feature. I think one person mentioned mine, which I'll bring up here, scripting. If you have not used scripting, yep. um, it's not that complicated. Um, you can define a procedure that you would typically do with it in the, the interface or in the GUI of Global Mapper as a text file. Um, I have an example, but I'm not going to show it because we're getting towards the end of our presentation. But um, we will have sometime, I believe, in October, a dedicated session on scripting. Uh, again, it's the ability for you to automate procedures through simple entry of, of commands and parameters in a text file. I like to tell people if you can type in Microsoft Notepad or, or Windows Notepad, you can create a script. 
And you'll, we'll prove that if you come to that presentation in October, we'll give, go into some detail about scripting. It's a different way of using Global Mapper's processing engine without having to interact with the interface. And you can automate a lot of tasks and have them, have them kind of perform in the background. So scripting was my S. T. Any suggestions for T? Hmm. 3D PDF export. Oh, that would have been a good one, yeah. <laughs> 3D PDF, you can export any 3D data to a dedicated 3D PDF. It opens in Acrobat and appears as a nice little 3D model. Someone mentioned transparency, in yeah. the imagery transparency. So, or, or vector transparency, you can assign yeah. you know, the colors of a vector to be transparent. Topology, you know, the geographic integrity of your data. Snapping would be kind of related to topology. My T is thematic mapping. And again, with apologies, I'm not going to go through the workflow itself example you see on the screen here, the ability to differentiate the visual characteristics of one of your, your vector data to reflect some variable. This is data we use in our training classes. This is actually some property information. The colors represent the value of the property. There's a, you go into the settings to, or go into the options for a layer. You can alter the display based on an attribute. And in this case, it was obviously an attribute that reflected those property values. So thematic mapping, important part of Global Mapper in terms of uh, conveying inherent information in your attributes. You, getting towards the end of the alphabet. Hmm. I had one for this, unload data. Unload, oh, do you remember the keyboard <laughs> shortcut for that one, Billy? I'm uh, putting a spot here. Control U. <laughs> control U, that's the easy one, you control U. If you clean off your map, and I've done it a few times even today, control U to on, unload. Some people are saying undo. Now, Undo is available in certain functions. If you're digitizing drawing, you can undo the last vertex or repeatedly. You can undo if you delete something. As far as additional undo, it's something that we are considering, obviously. Um, we've had many requests. It's probably the number one request we have on our to-do list or our wish list. And we're taking a look at implementing that. So at, and at some point in the future, you'll likely have a more universal undo. It's an extremely complex process to initiate that. But hold, it, hold that thought for now. <laughs> underneath somebody has under subsurface mapping they refer to that as underneath I guess that's one way of describing subsurface mapping underneath yeah we can we can map multiple surfaces the 3d display can display multiple surfaces my U, URL support uh, you can embed a link uh, in any object in global mapper this one I am going to demonstrate and with apologies we are going to overshoot the top of the hour um, just by a little bit. We're almost at the end of the alphabet, at the end of the alphabet, but this is an interesting one. Um, I'm gonna drag in another workspace. Uh, this happens to be my home state. Um, I'm actually quite close to where site three is here. These are just simulated job sites. Uh, they're little points on the map. I I'm gonna use the digitizer to select my site two here, and I'm going to apply a link to this. Now this can be a link to a document, a photograph, a website, whatever. I can apply whatever link I want. Um, if I edit, that feature and look at the attributes. There's no attributes here, it's just a point, but I have the option, as you see, to add a file link. Now, I'm gonna use the option simply to browse. It's remembered where I was before. And what I'm going to add specifically is a global mapper workspace. Was that site two? It was site two. I'm gonna choose this workspace to be linked to that point. And obviously I could do the same for my other sites as well. That's basically defined the path to that GMW file. Those familiar with Google Mapper will know that that's a Google Mapper workspace file. That now becomes a link embedded in that point. If I use my info tool now and click on site two, it recognizes the presence of the link. And this again will be true of any linked file, whether it be an image or a website, it will recognize that and give me this dialog box and say, oh, do you want to display the information or would you rather I actually loaded the link. And I can do that in one of two ways. I can load it in Global Mapper because it recognizes it as a supported format or in Windows. I'm actually gonna choose in Windows in this case because what that will do is it will ask uh, Windows to open up whatever file, uh, whatever application is associated with that file. In my case, it's gonna be a new instance of Global Mapper. So I'll click okay. And hopefully I'll get a new Global Mapper instance popping up here in just a second with the contents of that workspace. There it is, I've got some LiDAR data and some imagery. And I've also got the original Global Mapper version sitting in the background. So you can create an index map, if you like, with all your projects, with all your workspaces linked geographically to where they're located. Simply click on one and it will pop up 
in a new instance of Global Mapper, and you can see all of the data that pertains pertains to that specific job site. So URL support, URL linking, is another supported format, another supported function, I should say. Okay. V. Any V's coming in, Billy? Uh, I see one vectorizing raster data. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, let's say select the layer and you right click and create area features and it creates vector features from rasters based on color matching. I think I did that one in the last webinar. I think you did, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Volume calculation. Yeah. Another one that came in. There were variations on that theme, different ways, cut and fill volume, and that would have been another C one, cut and fill, but yeah, volume calculation, various flavors if you've got terrain data. We'll do a lot of those in the terrain analysis webinar coming up. My V is view share analysis. Uh, again, I'm not going to do this one. Uh, on terrain analysis function, you define a point of origin, you define the view shed parameters, you get what you see in this slide. Basically, this is a, a coverage map, if you like. It shows me if I was standing at the location of my cell phone tower, and you can artificially exaggerate the height. I think this is like a, a 20 meter tall tower. What can I see? Areas not shaded are beyond the range. So view shed analysis, basically shows you what you can see visually or shows you the extent of what would be covered with a broadcast signal. View shed analysis, my V, W. Billy, do you have any yeah. W's for me? We have workspace. <laughs> of course, that would have been an obvious one. We've been dealing with workspaces all along. Uh, seems related to watershed seems to be a very popular one. I, I think that, that's probably an obvious one, watershed analysis, <laughs> and I do have an example of watershed analysis here. Yeah, the ability to model the potential for the terrain to support the flow of water. There are various types of watershed analysis. Um, I'll bring up the interface quickly. I'm not going to do this again. We've overshot by a little bit, but watershed analysis triggered by this button in the toolbar, obviously with the presence of a terrain layer. Um, the example specifically that I have here is the, the delineation of a catchment for a specific location. So I selected this point and I asked it to determine what ultimately flows to this point. It, mono, it uh, analyzes the pixel uh, elevation values to determine what flow direction and what flow accumulation would be uh, accomplished and it delineates the extent. So this might be a drinking water source, this being an area that needs to be protected from any development. Watershed analysis is, again, multiple other flavors of watershed analysis. Uh, if it's something you're interested in, you know, you can explore that tool as well. Which brings us to the challenging one. X. That's a good guess already. XML support. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, GML is a, a geographic version of XML. is a supported format. Yeah, absolutely. XYZ file. <laughs> Somebody's been creative here. X sections. Yeah, that would cross be section. Yeah. Sense, yeah. Any other X's? I think I think there is a fairly obvious one. I think someone has mentioned this before. And this for the next three letters, we're going to wrap up here. Define ultimately how we manage our. Uh, address or render data in Google Mapper. X, obviously, our x-axis, of course. Next letter, Y, will we add the second dimension. And finally, to wrap up, G. An illustration of the fact that a lot of the work that's done in Global Mapper is done in three dimensions. Yes, traditionally, top-down is how we perceive the world, but our world is 3D and we work both with X, Y, and Z or Z data. And just to kind of wrap up here, I have a little visualization. Hopefully this is coming through on the streamed version. It may not, it might be a little jerky, but obviously that's, you know, with GoToMaps, map, uh, GoToWebinar's um, streaming service, it might be coming through, but a little movie here showing our little line feature from multiple directions. So we, we started with ABCs, we ended with X, Y, and see, and hopefully you enjoyed that little alphabetical romp through Global Mapper. Billy, thank you for scanning the suggestions as they came in. It was very helpful. I could not have done that without you, I promise. No problem. Um, Our users are very creative. And <laughs> I think so too. I'm going to be looking at this list as a, as a backup and maybe there'll be version two of this coming as well. Um, for those of you in attendance who are not familiar with Global Mapper, hopefully some of what we showed you was appealing. If you want to try a copy or download a copy, you'll note here in the final slide, bottom of the, the screen there, 
bluemarblegeo.com dash trial. You can grab a trial version free of charge, 14 days, try out all the tools that I showed you today, maybe some of the other tools as well. Um, if you have information on licensing, um, some of the licensing options we have, orders at bluemarblegeo.com. And I know there were a few technical questions that came in that we didn't have a chance to answer today. I'm going to suggest you take a note of the email address, geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. The folks in with Billy's uh, comrades in the tech support crew will be more than happy to help you with any of the, those technical questions, either that came up today or that you have about our software in general. Again, Billy, thank you very much for your help, and we will see you in a couple of weeks when we talk about MangoMap. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks, David.